Praise I sing, I sing. He's my blessed my Savior, He's my King, my blessed King. Streams of love around my soul are flowing. From His heart, love's everlasting spring. That is why my faith in Him I'm showing. That is why an endless song I sing. He's my precious King, and oh, I dearly love Him. He's my glorious King, no other is above Him. All day long in raptured praise I sing, I sing. He's my blessed Savior, He's my King, my blessed King. In His light I'm going home to glory with the souls who trust His saving grace. Going home to sing and tell His story in the blessed sunshine of his face he's my precious king and oh i dearly love him he's my glorious king no other is above him all day long in raptured praise i sing i sing he's my blessed savior he's my king my blessed king Here we are but straying pilgrims, here our path is often dim. But to cheer us on our journey still, we sing this wayside hymn. Yonder over the rolling river, where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our feet are often weary on the hills that throng our way. Here the tempest darkly gathers, but our hearts within us say, Yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansions rise, Soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our souls are often fearful of the pilgrim's lurking foe, but the Lord is our defender, and he tells us we may know. Yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. If for the prize we have striven, after our labors are o'er, 
Rest to our souls will be given on the eternal shore. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam. Free from all care, happy and bright, Jesus is there, he is the light. Oft in the storm, lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee. Beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea, the crystal sea. Yes, a sweet rest is remaining for the true children of God, where there will be no complaining, never a chastening rod. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest. Never to roam, free from all care, happy and bright. Jesus is there, he is the light. Oft in the storm, lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee. Beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea, the crystal sea. Soon the bright homeland adorning, we shall behold the glad dawn. Lean on the Lord till the morning, trust till the night has gone. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam. Free from all care, happy and bright, Jesus is there. He is the light, oft in the storm, lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee. Beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea, the crystal sea. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away, I'll fly away. By and by, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. When the shadows of this life have grown, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Like a bird from prison bars have flown, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away, fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away, fly away, fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. Fly away, fly away, I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, fly away in the morning, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away, when peace like a river Attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, 
trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless. Good evening, everybody. It is, uh, again, a pleasure to get to spend a Wednesday evening uh, with all of you and enjoy uh, getting to spend some time together, worship and pray and study together as well. I'm very glad to have my wife, Lee, with us again tonight as well. It's kind of a treat. We escape greater metropolitan Henderson and make our way, make our way over and get to worship together. I'm grateful for the invitation. And it is, uh, it's a real pleasure, especially to get to talk about the topic that we have in front of us this evening. It's one that Justin and the others, whomever set this up, had planned and given this. And I'm excited to get to, to address this topic because, in my opinion, it's one of the most significant topics that we could address in the 21st century as members of the Lord's Church. As you'll notice on the screen, the title says, Can the Church Be What? What would we say? Evangelistic? Can the church be Christ-like? Can we be effective in our modern world? But the one that we're really interested in tonight is one that at its fundamental level answers all of the other things, or at least lays the foundation. And it's the question, can the church that we read of in the pages of the Bible be restored and Christianity practiced as it was introduced in the days of Jesus' apostles and disciples as Christianity was born and began to spread. The real question, if we phrased it this way, is you and I want to practice the faith that we read about right here. I want to be able to know Jesus, to know about the work that he did, the door of grace and salvation that is opened up through his sacrifice. You and I want to know how we can talk to other people about becoming a member of the Lord's church, a member of God's family. We want to ask questions like, how should I live as a Christian? What should I do in my daily life so that I reflect the love and the goodness and the righteousness of my God and my Savior? To do that, we have to be able to answer the question, what do we live by? What steps do we walk in? And whose model or example do we follow ourselves? Can we practice the faith that is read about right here? And I know the whole Bible is important for us, but specifically the pages of the New Testament. Can we practice those things in 2022 and the years that may be ahead of us as well? 
It's unfortunate that there's a very common answer that is sometimes given that is not a favorable one to that question. It might be that you hear this from, sad to say, a member of the Lord's church. Now, I'm not necessarily surprised when I hear this common answer of no, that that time is in the past. I'm not surprised necessarily when I hear that from someone who is not a member of the Lord's church. I've done my studies in the past at uh, different seminaries and universities that are affiliated with different denominational groups at times. It's just the way that it worked out. But what that's meant is there have been opportunities to have conversations about the nature of Christian living or becoming a Christian or what that should look like. And I've heard people, even in fact this just this last weekend, say that's not who they want to be and that's not something that's even doable. But it's even worse in my estimation when we hear this said by members of the Lord's church. Maybe a professor at a university or a college who simply says, well, we are members of the churches of Christ or the the Stone Campbell movement or other titles that are used. But you know, that's just our preference. And there's not really any good reason other than that's just what our family heritage might include. And so they look at this and say, no, there's no real chance that we can go back and practice the things that are found here and say that New Testament Christianity is being practiced in our context, in our time. It's horrible, but that's how some people, even in the church, look at things. What's sometimes not thought about are the consequences that come as a result of this. And I want to spend the the beginning part of our time exploring this issue of, of consequences, For example, if someone says that there is no way to go back and to practice the things that are found here, then what is it that they are going to tie their expectations, their expressions of Christian faith, what are they going to tie it to? And if there's no anchor in the first century to which we can lash ourselves, then we really are at the whim of whatever dominant voice or cultural influences, or family preferences that might take place at any particular time. Just the feelings of the moment. We really are talking tonight about the question of where is our anchor that ties us down to something that is reliable, that is usable, that is profitable, beneficial, and ultimately we know is linked to our Creator and our Savior. That's what's really at risk. So, if you stop for just a moment and think about the nature of the modern conception of Christianity, a contemporary view would look at the body of Christ, and use that term very, very broadly, and would say that it's like a pie. And in this pie, the whole thing represents the body of Christ, but you could divide it into a number of segments. And each of those segments is their own I don't know what we might say, flavor of the pie. So, for example, there might be a slice that is Baptist or Methodist or Church of Christ or Presbyterian or other. But in this modern conception, since there's no anchor to the first century that defines who we are and how we think, how we live, how we practice, then the shape of each of these slices is really determined by the individual. And if this were really true, then guess what you can do with this pie? There's no reason why it has to stay at eight slices. I mean, there's nothing sacred about the number eight. So what if all of a sudden those participants and church members think, well, I'd like a slightly different variation. I'd like a slightly different slice of the pie. And all of a sudden, the number grows again. And what you see are just names that become increasingly specific to one segment. And if you know the word ecumenical or the word ecumenism or things like that, it all reflects this type of imagery. This is the body of Christ. You can attend the church of your choice. You may have heard that phrase spoken about, talked about positively or negatively through the years. But that's really what this represents. There are just more flavors from which to choose. Take the one that is most appealing to you. And by the way, there's nothing in this framework of thought, there's nothing that is particularly sacred about any one of those slices over and above the others. So guess what members sometimes do? Members may become unhappy with 
one of the slices that they have been a part of. Can I do this? I can. So they may not be happy in this slice. Well, that's okay. Just hop over to this one or over to this one or over to this one because none of them are favored and none of them have a claim on truth and none of them are claiming to be linked to the first century in some, um, you know, some unchangeable fashion. And so people feel able to move frequently. All right, well, there's nothing, I don't know how many slices those are. There are a lot of them there. But you don't have to stop there. And so you can just keep dividing and dividing and dividing. And that's exactly what's happened over time. And suddenly people begin to create their own very freely, very openly. As an example, in the year 1900, demographers, those who study groups and peoples, demographers identified 1,800 different Christian groups worldwide. Now, I don't mean different congregations, you know, one in this corner, one in that corner, one in that corner. I mean 1,800 different flavors, if you will, under the name Christian. But if we can really change, and there's nothing that's fixed that we have to stand upon, then there's no reason why 1,800 has to be a sanctified number either. And so just one century later, in the year 2000, 22 years ago, the number had mushroomed to more than 33,000 different Christian organizations. Again, these are not individual congregations. These are different groups, right? They all have a different idea of their origins, a different idea of their belief systems, and a different idea of their practices in one way or another. And so it suddenly becomes this smorgasbord. Individuals are encouraged to choose. Now, I don't, I don't uh, know how you select from a buffet with 33,000 you know, items to choose from, but the idea is at least there. So when I was a, when I was a kid, in Rolling Stone magazine, there was, a, uh, there was an ad that one of my classmates saw, and it said, start your own church. And you sent in, you know, two bucks, three bucks or something like that, and you gave your name and what you wanted to do, and, and um, you could get the paperwork. They would send it to you so that you would start your own, your own church. And so my friend did that with his uncle, and my friend's name... Um, was not deacon, but when they set up the paperwork, his uncle was going to be the pastor, and he was going to be the deacon. And it stuck. He was deacon, and he's changed his name. Legally, he's deacon today. And they sent in there a couple of bucks, and I lived in small town, rural Oklahoma, and they started the Church of the Mangy Coon. Didn't sound very fancy. It wasn't meant to be that fancy. It was just meant to be a joke for him, you know, a, a seventh grader and an uncle. But what if I told you that I had a professor... In seminary, Austin Presbyterian Seminary, he was a nice fellow. He taught a class from the New Testament that I took. But after class one, of the, one day, he got to talking about a particular experience of his when he um, had gone to an American Academy of Religion conference. And after the sessions had completed in their conference room, he just stuck around, knew some of the persons, and watched. And some of the people that had been in that session, professors at different universities and seminaries across America, sat there and he said, Rick, I watched a denomination be born. They sat there, took out, this is days of paper and pencil more, uh, got to describing this is what our church group is going to be called. This is how it's going to be organized. These are the things that we're going to believe, and we're going to practice, and we're going to promote. He said, I watched the denomination be born right there in a conference room at a hotel. But that's not inconsistent with the whole idea that is behind this, right? I mean, if we can start this, then we can start that, and who's to say that this over here is not going to be appropriate? Now, question. If this is true about Christianity in general, and no form or expression or anything like that is to be favored or, or um, you know, cherished above the others, then why would Christianity be cherished above the rest of the world's religions? I mean, what would make sense along this line of thought is that all of a sudden, this huge pie that represents the body of Christ, so to speak, is really just one religion that sits at the table with all of the other world religions as well. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, New Ageism, and I, you know, we could slice that pie thinner and more detailed as well. 
And so in this outlook, when we say, no, there's no way to practice the first century faith, then what that means is we have no tether to the past, and so anything in the present becomes permissible. It is entirely dependent upon personal preference at some level. At some level. As an illustration of that, Lee and I lived for 23 years or so in an Austin Texas area. And I can remember reading in the newspaper on one occasion a statement by an individual who was a chaplain at a local high school. And in this article, this is what she described her goal to be. She wanted to bring diversity to daily chapel services for these uh, about 400 students in this religious private high school. And along the way, you'll notice that she's working as a Christian-oriented, I'm going to use that very loosely, a Christian-oriented high school, and and she represents that faith background. But you can see from the words that she doesn't see Christianity as being privileged over any other world religion. And so she's perfectly happy trying to invite these other figures. Maybe she thinks she's giving the students something to look at or something to think about that is going to be, I don't know, eye-opening or such. So she describes it as a post-denominational opportunity. What that means, we've moved past just thinking Christianity is the faith and you just have your denominational form. Now we don't even think Christianity is the faith. It's just one among many. So she wants to expose kids to a wide range of thought. Now when the children, young persons, graduate from this high school, whatever else they may have learned, trigonometry and English and uh, so forth, What are they going to carry with them spiritually when they go? The answer is they have no anchor and no tether to know nothing, right? And I've got to think about Christianity as it was introduced in the pages of the New Testament, and that is not at all how it was intended to be um, structured in people's minds. If you were to go back to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, for example, verses 9 and 10, here is Paul who is very diligently representing Christianity in its infancy, in its purity. And he comes into the city of Thessalonica, and in his letter he details what their purpose was. He said, you know our coming in to you, right? And he says, we turned you from idols to the one true and living God, and to wait for his Son, who will come judgment, Jesus the Christ. They already had diversity, just like we have diversity in our world today. Paul did not come in and bless the diversity. He didn't say, this is good. I see that you have a wide array of options for our middle and high school students to contemplate. What he said is, we're trying to narrow down from all of these paths that shouldn't be followed to the one that should be. He spoke in singular terms. He spoke in a a unitary way. There's one path, Paul would say, that people need to follow. And that's our challenge is to be able to see that and to follow that in the 21st century and not apologize, not be arrogant, but not apologize for being able to say, Jesus knows the way. And it's our responsibility to submit and to follow. It's always the blessing. Nobody ever came to the end of their life as a faithful Christian and looked back and said, boy, what a waste. I wish I hadn't been so faithful to the Lord. I wish I hadn't been the recipient of all of his blessings. Nobody ever says that. But on the other hand, people do look back at times, and I know because I've known some of these persons, and they regret that they didn't obey the gospel sooner, that they didn't build a relationship with God sooner, that they didn't live their lives in the footsteps of Jesus and bring goodness wherever they could go. I've known people that regret that. So God is trying to turn us to a path that stands out as a beacon of light and hope amidst all of the confusion and mistaken ideas that are out there. All right, restoration. We talked about that for a minute. What you see on the screen is a group known as the Avazon Ensemble. And if you look, I don't know how easy it is to see some of the things up there. You might identify some of the instruments. I see things that look kind of like violins or violas or cellos or basses. And then there's this unusual instrument right there. I don't know what that is. I just know it's got a lot of strings. The Avazon Ensemble has made a name for itself not only for its just musical excellence, but they are a period group. They play period pieces. 
Now what that phrase means, and it's a pretty specific phrase, what it means is that they try to play music composed in previous generations or, or centuries using the instruments that were employed at the time the music was composed. And their thought is, by doing this, you step in as the audience member and you listen and you are hearing, ideally, what the composer in 1870 or 1690, what the composer wanted the audience to hear in that day and in that time. Okay, it's a neat project. And I've listened to some of their pieces, pretty good, I, I like. Alfa Romeo, Alfa Romeo. Italian-made car in Milan, <clears throat> at least it's heritage, right? It's one of those cars people fall in love with, I guess, at times. Maybe it just sort of uh, tickles their you know, fancy. And it's amazing to talk to car enthusiasts. Some of them I have worked with, or I know, a David Leip, or a... Yeah, Mark Blackwelder or others. And they like to take a car, and you know that they put the pieces together. You may, this may be you, right? In restoring a car to its original condition, the goal is to get it to look just like it was when it sat on the showroom floor. Yeah? And so we want to make sure that all the engine parts numbers match, for example, and the body pieces and things. We want to make sure that it is, uh, in the interior, it is set up to run the, and look the same way that it was when it came off of the assembly line or was finalized in production. It's going to have the same paint job and color that it came with. I mean, people spend thousands and thousands of dollars to do this. And they'll go around the world and try to find that missing piece. I need these numbers or I need this, this piece to do it. It's been jokingly said that someone might take a, an Alfa Romeo like this and, and need to fly it over to Milan in order to fill up the tires with Italian air, just to make sure it's legit. One other picture for you, or slide. Baseball. I came across this book accidentally, uh, just flitting through Amazon and other things, but this was published, it's a facsimile, um, but it was published initially in 1867. In 1867, and it's a baseball's book, a book of reference, right? And so if you look inside of it, it's got the rules and the setup. You know, the game a little bit different in 1867 than it is played in 2022, right? But if you wanted to play the way that those players in that mid-century played, there's your guide. If you want to look and play the way that baseball is played today, this year, there's your guide. Now, I want you to suppose we're going to do a thought experiment for just a second. I want you to, to imagine for just a moment that maybe, maybe baseball players and owners just reached an impasse that they could not resolve. And so a strike happened. And it just kept going until pretty soon people lose interest in baseball completely. And over the years, it just becomes a forgotten sport. There are no young boys and girls who get a mitt and a ball and go to play catch. They're not out in an empty lot, you know, shagging flies and things like that. But all of a sudden, now it's the year 2357. And in 2357, someone is looking back through some archives, the way that we sometimes do in libraries and monasteries. And in this archive, they find the book that you see up there on your right. What happens if they open it up and they begin to practice the things that are found there? But let's suppose that they understand how they learn and they have some mitts that are made, they have balls that are made, they have bats that are made. They measure out and they have the requisite number of feet, base to base to base, home plate to pitcher's mound, etc. And then they get out there and play. What are they playing? Let's suppose that suddenly H.G. Wells' time machine, said, while we're imagining, why not? H.G. Wells' time machine, somebody hops in it and they jump forward from 2022 to 2357, and they watch. They don't know. They just, they're like, wow, look at all the changes. And they walk up, Whew, something I recognize. Boy, that's familiar. Why? Because they're watching these persons play their sport or their game. You don't even have to have someone who makes a chain that's unbroken from our year to that year. All you have to have is someone who has guidance and the willingness to put it into practice, and they're still going to be playing baseball. With that in mind, that's what I would suggest about Christianity. 
and the practice of the New Testament faith in the 21st century. As an example, I'd like for us to open up our Bibles and look together in the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 22. And if you have your Bible, I do encourage you to open up because we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at this passage, and I want you to hold in mind the topic of restoring, putting something back into practice that had somehow fallen into disuse or been changed through the years. 2 Kings chapter number 22. The first element is found here in verses 1 through 10, and we're going to call this section, if you're making you know, names or notes and so forth, we're going to call this an important recognition. And let's read together what the text says. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned another 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jadida, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkat. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the way, all the way of David his father. And he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may count the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. And let it be given into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the workmen who are at the house of the Lord, repairing the house. That is, to the carpenters and to the builders and to the masons. And let them use it for buying timber and quarried stone to repair the house. But no accounting shall be asked from them for the money that is delivered into their hand, for they deal honestly. And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have found, I'm sorry, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have brought, or sorry, who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And then Shaphan the secretary said to the king, or told the king, Hilkiah, the high priest, has given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. An important recognition, the book of the Lord. One of the things to note here, this is about 620, maybe 625 years before Christ. It is a decade and a half or so before the people of Judah are conquered, put under uh, vassalage by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Did you notice the description of the house of the Lord? That's the temple in Jerusalem, the one that Solomon had, had built many centuries prior. Did you notice how they're sending money to the carpenters and the masons and the others to refurbish this building? And the reason is because it's fallen into tremendous disrepair. How does that happen? With a building that's not being used, that's not being maintained or kept up, I wonder what they're doing at this building. So they have a property that they know belongs to the Lord, but I'm not sure that it's been used the way that the Lord would have intended. All right, what else do you notice? They have priests and high priests. I'm sure that these are individuals who wear the clothing that the priests were expected to wear. They probably know their family tree or lineage the way that uh, the priests were to be in a family, part of the family of, of Aaron, Moses' brother. So they have a lot of the activities going on. They have a structure, apparently some types of services. They have a staff. They have clothing and other things. But isn't it interesting that the thing that's found in this passage, as if it were that baseball book tucked away in a library nobody's seen, is the book of the Lord, the book of the law. It's the law of Moses. When I look at that, it makes me realize that people can go through the motions, the activities associated with a particular religion or a particular church, but that does not mean that they're well-informed in knowing what they're doing or practicing or believing. The outside, if you will, the trappings, the physical elements may be right, but that does not necessarily mean that comprehension is there or that people are doing the things that they ought to do. And that's exactly what the king recognized when he had this book read in his presence. In fact, you'll notice his important 
reaction to the things that he read or heard read. Beginning in verse number 11. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Achbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the secretary, and Asiah the king's servant, saying, Go and inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, and here's the answer why, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So, Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam, and Achbor, and Shaphan, and Isaiah went to hold of the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikbah, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they talked with her. And she said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster on this place and upon all of the inhabitants. All the words of the book that a king of Judah has read. Why? Because they have forsaken me and have made me offerings, uh, or have made offerings to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent, and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you've torn your clothing and wept before me, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they brought back word to the king. My question would be, why does King Josiah react in the way that he does? If he had an outlook that was comparable to a contemporary view regarding Christianity and perhaps even all world religions, then he would look at that and say, oh, that's a very interesting historical study. Oh, so that's what our ancestors used to do. Hmm, neat. I'll write a position paper about that. Maybe they will have taught it to others and said, here's what the history used to be, but of course, this is the 7th century and we don't do that anymore. Right? But the Bible says that he realized immediately the grave mistakes that had been made. What he saw was that the law of Moses was comprehensible, it had been communicated, and now it just needed to be followed. And they had not done that. In the ancient world, when they would tear their clothing, you probably know this, they, that's a sign of mourning. It is a sign of doom and woe. The world has just been rocked. We're facing disaster. And so that's what he felt when he recognized what we've been doing is not what we read about. So we need to do what we read about. He sent and he made the inquiry of the Lord. And if you see the Lord's response, he's very complimentary to King Josiah. He describes him as having a penitent heart, an humble heart, one that was teachable. He was able to be guided and uh, pointed in the right direction. And so God says, in spite of all of these things, you I'm going to bless and I'm going to take care of, and through the rest of his reign. Right. Question. If there is no going back and practicing some teachings of the past, centuries removed, then why would Josiah be angry? Or upset? Why would God be angry? And the answer is, we can practice the things in the past. And not just can, but we can say we should if they're the things that the Lord has installed or appointed or implemented. Which leads us to the last part, an important response. 2 Kings 23, verses 1 through 25. Now, I'm not going to read all 25 verses of that. I'll leave that to you as... I, I don't want to use the word homework because that's too painful, but um, let's say home devotion and reading. But I do want to notice just a couple of things right at the beginning. In chapter 23, beginning in verse 1, the king sent and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. 
And he went up to the house of the Lord with him, all the men of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all of his heart and all his soul to perform the, to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. Now, a covenant is just another word for an agreement, but it is a formal agreement. It's made by these multiple parties where they each say, this is what I will do, and these are the benefits that I receive, and the other party says similar types of things. It's an agreement, and they make it here with the Lord not to implement new. Isn't that interesting? They're not creating something in a ballroom or a conference room at a hotel or anything like that. They're not creating something new. They make an agreement to do what? To go back and to practice what would be called the old or the ancient as they needed to do. I've always been impressed with the patience of God because over a long period of time, certainly the Israelites would get into trouble with the Lord. And he would punish them as a parent punishes children from time to time. But I always appreciate the fact that he was trying to encourage them to consider the path they were walking and return in fidelity and faithfulness to the things that he brought through Moses. If you were to read Nehemiah chapter 9, for example, it's written later, right? Um, It's in the 5th century. But when the writer is, uh, Nehemiah and others are reading there, and they're praying in chapter 9, and one of the things in this prayer is an acknowledgement. God, over and over again, You sent prophets and other people to try to wake us up. You kept trying to catch our attention and get us on the right path. We just didn't listen all those various times. The problem is not the interests of a concerned deity. He's there. The problem is not access to or the availability of divine teaching. It's here. The problem is whether or not people are convinced to give this a fair hearing and to recognize the importance of putting it into practice. Not just to hold at arm's length any potential punishment. Christianity is not just about getting out of punishment. Christianity is about being able to relate to our God and Creator when we have made a mess of relationships and God has a way to put things back together. And in the ancient world, if they can go back and restore the practice of the law of Moses given nearly a thousand years before, why is it so incredible to think that we can't pra- to think that we can practice the New Testament faith a couple of thousand years after the fact as well? There shouldn't be anything about that that strikes us as either impossible even or even undesirable. And so we come down to an important resolution. And this is really kind of wrapping things up. I know we're not quite done yet, but the the takeaways from all of this. I want to talk about those for a minute. Think about a treasure map. And in a treasure map, typically you have an X marks the spot, and there's some buried treasure there, and everyone goes crazy. We've got to find it. And they may start off from one place, and they're you know, going through the countryside looking for the, the buried treasure, the signs, the spot. Okay, here it is. Somebody else has started off in a different area, and of course it's a race to get there first. Wherever they started is really kind of immaterial in a way because they know where they're trying to go. Have you ever thought of Christianity like that? God knows how he would like every person to live, to serve, to to be his child, right? We have an image of Jesus who uh, puts these things before us repeatedly through the pages of the Bible. But what we do is we come to that image from different starting points, perhaps, right? There are certain things that I need sanded off the rough edges in my life to become more Christ-like, things maybe I wrestle with. You don't wrestle with those same things, perhaps. But you have your own. And so you come at this, and there are other types of changes or adjustments maybe that you make in saying, yes, I submit, I want to become a disciple of Jesus the Christ. 
It doesn't matter where we start, in a sense. All of us need the relationship made possible through Jesus. But it's a journey to become like this image that God has set before us. Whatever pathway that involves for us individually. Well, you know, we can't talk about any of that kind of language without talking about going back to the pages found here. Because it's here where we learn about Jesus. It's here where we learn about what Christianity was initiated to be and what early Christians were asked to be and people would be taught to do and to respond. In every age, God always has this expectation. And the appeal is always to have people come back to that when they've gone astray and off the path. The only real question is whether you and I have a similar mindset as that of Josiah. Would we be willing to say, I don't need to go the path that is contrary to what's found here. I need the path God has stipulated because that's where I'm blessed and that's where he's glorified in my life. So we need to be familiar with this. I once read an article in the Austin American Statesman newspaper. It was in the op-ed section, you know, the letters to the editor. <clears throat> And somebody wrote in, a woman wrote in, and she said, just a little blip, she said that she was essentially tired of the arrogance of Christians. Now, that word is being used very broadly. She wasn't just talking about the Lord's Church. right? She was tired of the, the arrogance of Christians. She said, we ought to honor all the gods and religions that people create. And I read that, and I thought, boy, she got this thing backwards, or at least in part. In her mind, we create our gods, we create our religions, and then we pursue them at the level of fidelity and, and vigor that we prefer. But is that so different than what we saw on the screen with the pies and the circles? Because in each of those instances, we have individuals creating or groups who are creating their own version. And pretty soon, God is looking a lot like them. They create God in their own image. Their churches, their religions reflect themselves and their own preferences. You know, that's exactly the opposite to what really has happened. Here's God, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, creating us in his image. And then every stage of human history has had aspirations and goals that we are benefited by following. And Christianity is no less true in that particular regard. Today, we want to practice the same faith that the early Christians practiced. Here's another one of those thought experiments. We had the baseball uh, manual on the board, right, 2022. And we said if somebody were to transport forward a few centuries and watch some people, what would they think? Oh, you know, how people get to the stadium or the, the playing field is different. I, you know, I don't know what they'll use. I don't know if they use Chevys or Fords. or I, I don't know what 2357 has for transportation. They may get there a little differently, right? But once they get inside that field and start playing, what are they playing? They're playing baseball. All right, let me ask you this. Let's say Sunday morning. Sunday morning you gather here to worship, and you have the things that you're going to do, the lesson is prepared, the, the readiness to fellowship and to you know, praise God. Let me just suppose for a minute that Paul or Peter or Mary Magdalene or John or others walked in the door back there and came inside and observed. I would imagine that they would be quite intrigued by the fact that you can flip a switch and these light bulbs come on. That's pretty impressive. I would imagine that they would be appreciative of air conditioning. I mean, aren't we all, right? They might think, wow, I really like these padded seats on these benches. This is great. But that's all just trimmings, yeah? What if they sat and listened to the sermon? What would they say? What if, having a communion table, you know, or something, what if they watched and listened to the things that were being said and the prayers that were offered, would they feel at home? When the songs were being sung, even if we do it slightly different arrangements, multiple parts, etc., songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, would they look and say, that's a good song. It teaches truth, it encourages, it praises. Because my fear would be that in many different churches across the land, they might walk in the door and they might sit down and say, what is that? Or where did that notion or idea come from? We never taught anything like that. And you could imagine, I mean, they wrote the pages, so all of a sudden they could look over and say, oh, 
<laughs> there's a Bible, okay? And they opened it up, and they're like, oh, yeah, that is what I wrote. Yep, there it is. And they look down and they say, I don't see what they're doing anywhere in here. You think of that as something like a litmus test because we're asking the people who were tasked by Jesus to introduce Christianity to the world to stop and take a peek at what we're doing. In the end, as a part of the same family, we want to be a part of the same movement, the same discipleship, the same church, which means that, yes, it can be restored, but number two, we have to be intentional about it and want it to happen. We have words here on the screen from our brother in Christ named Everett Ferguson. Everett Ferguson is a retired professor of church history. And a tremendous career, a faithful member of the church too, right? And um, he made this comment. He said, although the position is often stated as a restoration, you may have heard this, right? Quote, a restoration of the New Testament church, end quote. The plea is really, and more precisely, he says, for a return to apostolic authority over the intervening history and an attempt to implement apostolic teaching and practice regarding the church in our very different cultural mix today. You see, he's honest about the fact that we do live in a different cultural setting. I mean, it doesn't take much to walk out and observe that. But notice what he says. When we're talking about restoration, we are talking about putting ourselves under the authority of the inspired teaching that Jesus' apostles and others carried into the world. And valuing what's said here more than what's taught by any particular period or group or committee or council anywhere else later in history. He says to be really biblical, to be practicing the faith, is to put ourselves under the authority of this teaching right here. And then we will be exactly the people and the church that God wants us to be. That's not an impossibility. That's just a decision that we have the power to make favorably. And surely the words that were spoken from the Lord toward Josiah could be spoken toward us as well. A penitent heart, an humble willingness to practice the things that were set down long ago gives us an anchor, it gives us a tether, it gives us something reliable to depend upon, and even to teach our children. I've always been struck by this quote from N.B. Hardiman, or statement by N.B. Hardiman in one of his tabernacle sermons, when he said, regarding the gospel and having it, he said, you realize that we and our children, grandchildren, get to slake our thirst from the same fountain or well that our grandparents and previous generations quenched their thirst from as well. In today's world, that type of continuity and anchoring is lost, forgotten, but it doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be. Here's where we need to stand, and we'll never look back and say, I I wish I'd chosen a different path. We'll look back and say, I'm glad I walked the pathway of righteousness. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. Let's close with a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this lovely Wednesday evening for the presence of our fellow Christians, those who are walking the same pathway. We're thankful for your graciousness towards us that you give us grace and mercy through your son Jesus, but that you also educate us and point our feet in the right direction. Father, we pray for our world that there would be those who have humble and penitent hearts as well and that we all might as well. We pray, Father, that we might put into practice faithfully those things that you have preserved in your word for our education, our edification. Father, may we represent you to the world well so that others may see us and praise you and be willing and wanting to walk in the footsteps of Jesus also. Father, when there are so many who are confused, so many conflicting voices out there, we pray that we might just simply speak of thus saith the Lord and allow people to appreciate the wisdom and the beauty that is found in your word. May we always live it through our days. We ask you to forgive us when we're not the persons that we should be. We say things perhaps we ought not or do things that we would later regret. And Father, we ask that we be forgiven. We're grateful for that mercy and grace. But we pray that we stand again and we help to walk in the right path and show others the right way as well. Thank you for all of the goodness and riches that you bring into our lives every day. And Father, with all of our breath and all of our energy, may we serve you 
and bring you glory and honor as you deserve. It's in the name of Jesus, your Son, that we pray. Amen.